Great. So uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, digital drug discovery cross-site meeting. Uh, it's exciting to uh, be doing this uh, new format. And I hope that um, we can uh, learn a lot from each other this way. Um, so uh, briefly go through the program. Uh, firstly, uh, Roger here is going to be talking about why is it so hard to search ultra-large chemical libraries. Um, in, we had a talk from Oxford, where Matteo Furler is going to talk about uh, his latest work, Fragmentstein. And Andrea Volkmer is going to talk from Berlin about data-driven methods for active compound design and risk assessment. And we're going to follow this up uh, by uh, some networking in the pub, um, both uh, locally for uh, with free events for the three different uh, meetings. And uh, those of you who are online, um, please do stay in the Zoom call and we will put everyone into breakout rooms um, so that you can uh, meet each other and have a chat. Um, so just a few brief house conferences keeping points. Uh, this meeting is being recorded uh, and please post your questions in the chat or um, um, at the end. Um, and uh, if you want to wish if you want to present a future meeting, uh, please do get in touch with us. Um, so the idea for this uh, meeting is from Chris Swain uh, of Cambridge Medicine Consulting. Um, and uh, it's been variously organized by Andreas here in Cambridge, um, and uh, Sam Carled, Garrett Morris, uh, Fernando Duarte, Philip Biggin in Oxford, uh, Gerhard Volber, and Clara Christ at Bayer in Berlin, and uh, Jürgen Harter and the CCDC have been very generous uh, and agreed to host us here in Cambridge. And um, I, this is just a bit of a plug uh, for the fact that they're hiring um, to uh, in several roles, discovery science team leader, systems administrator, field application scientist, and a US-based sales executive. So if you're looking for a job, uh, please do consider them um, and visit their website for more information. Uh, that's all the housekeeping for now. Uh, so yeah. now we Let's will um, get on to Roger's talk. So um, Roger is the CEO and founder of NextMove Software uh, based in Cambridge. Um, they specialize in patent mining and building ultra large chemical libraries. And today he's going to be talking about why it's so hard to search ultra large chemical libraries. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Roger. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak. Uh, it's great to be both at an Oxford computational chemistry kitchen and uh, I mean, a Cambridge Chemical Matters Network meeting and in Berlin at the same time, uh, telecast you know, live around the world. Uh, I'd also like to thank you know, Andreas Bender for coming up with the, the, the title. Uh, why is it so hard to search uh, ultra-large chemical libraries? It gave me the unique opportunity to put a unique spin on this talk. Uh, normally, I stand up and, and, and try my best to avoid you know, a vendor talk, but give a very scientific exposition of all the correct ways to search very, very large databases. Uh, this time, I'm going to do exactly the reverse, something you don't see published very often. Uh, all the ways to do large chemical database search wrong, uh, and then you know, without pointing fingers and, and, and naming you know, what are the mistakes that other people make. So uh, rather than say, you know, these are all the positives, it's more like an Andreas Bender talk of you know, how much hype is there behind all of this? And then you know, uh, picking up the, the, the pus oozing sores uh, on the surface of the, the kinematics. <laughs> well, he had the nice positive talk at the Royal Society of Chemistry <laughs> meeting. Uh, you get the, 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 the reverse or the dark side of the force. Uh, and so it turns out that roughly there are about seven things uh, that make you know, searching ultra large libraries I mean, difficult. Uh, of course, the clue is in the name. Uh, it is because they're ultra large that they're difficult to search. Uh, but drilling down, I mean, it turns out that there are uh, about seven issues underneath the surface that, 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 that created as a particular type of challenge. Uh, 
the scale of the problem or the volume of the data has to be searched, uh, the scaling, how rapidly it is increasing, uh, the data that you have to search over, uh, uh, hardware and software, including even storage, uh, and then the similarity measure used to comparing things. And so uh, this is an overview of, of the rest of the slides of my talk uh, broken down into each of those areas. Uh, the scale of the problem. And of course, it all goes back, I mean, uh, there were large virtual libraries before and there'll be even larger virtual libraries in the future, uh, but I'd like to blame the Ukrainians uh, and their revolution. Uh, the work of Yuri Moroz and, and, and the fine folks at uh, Enamine and Chemspace uh, that essentially have tied the design and optimization of uh, large virtual libraries uh, to synthetic chemistry processes is that they sort of hide the process from you and just say basically that hey, uh, we will sell you any one of these sets of compounds. Um, one of the problems with many of the large databases that are out there, for example, you use uh, generative neural networks to generate billions upon trillions of molecules. Uh, but of course, the fact is no one's under, you know, underwriting them. They're not saying, I promise to sell you this, or I promise to make you this. Uh, it's the folks at NME and Wuxi, and I mean, and, uh, I mean uh, e, e molecule uh, so that, 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 you know, uh, turn these compound sets into to real order, order, orderable synthetical libraries. Uh, and in very small print at the bottom of, of here, you see the current release of the real database comprises 5.5 billion molecules, uh, which obey the rule of five, the data point order of real estate. It's that 5.5 billion uh, that creates the real problem. Uh, this is my first uh, homophonic joke. Uh, indiscreet is indiscreet, uh, for the wonders of, of, of the English speaking audience. Uh, not separated into parts is lacking of good judgment. It turns out that many of the large virtual libraries out there uh, can be made by parallel synthesis or expressed as R1 attached to R2 or have a unique uh, method of putting them together. But it turns out in the general case, we're interested in large numbers of discrete compounds as well. Uh, if you start working with a database such as Zinc22, uh, which has 4.5 billion compounds. Sorry, <laughs> sure, uh, uh, that, that better. Uh, uh, Yes, uh, zinc 2.2 with its 4.5 billion compounds is the union of enamine plus Wuxi plus mcule. And Wuxi itself is made from sets of you know, drug-like molecules and FDA approvals. Uh, there is no rhyme or reason to how things are put in there. And especially with things like enamine, where if they fail to make something or a, a customer orders a compound, they will remove it from the real space so people won't order it again next time. Uh, and so it's, it's not there's a, a, a unique, I mean, a, a simple way of generating all of these. Uh, the thing that makes this interesting is the huge amount of chemical space that is covered by these virtual libraries uh, is actually very useful in the drug discovery process and commercially. Uh, this just showing, for example, uh, Steve Pickett and the folks at, at the Computational Chemistry Group in Stevenage uh, were interested back in 2011 in a combinatorial library of these biviral sulfonamides uh, where they made, you know, attempted to make 25, I mean, 2,500 of them. It turns out if you look in enamine real at the moment uh, using the same scaffold as a core, uh, there's I mean, 671 uh, uh, examples of compounds that are just orderable off the shelf that would fill in the chemical space and help with the QSAR. Is that for most drug discovery projects, uh, there is now something of useful or relevance in, inside these large orderable compounds and catalog collections. And of course, the problem is with these large databases, all these billions in size, uh, is the curse of linearity. Uh, one of the obvious problems is a database that's five times the size, it takes five times longer to search, and it's 100 times as large, it takes 100 times longer to search. Uh, and that many of the methods that we used in cheminformatics, you know, as simple as two, I mean, five, 10 years ago, uh, just don't scale or can't keep up with this. Uh, it's interesting that, that, you know, when I started my career, or let's say 10 years ago, uh, a million molecules a second uh, was considered to be quite a reasonable search speed. It would allow you to search Kemble in about two seconds. Uh, PubChem would take, you know, two minutes, and current enamine would take an hour and a half, that basically you see that the scales have stopped being interactive. Things that we thought were instantaneous on these scales really start drawing to a halt. And so it turns out that modern state-of-the-art search systems, uh, you're really looking at sort of 1.5 billion chemical fingerprint comparisons per second, uh, on, you know, or 5.5 billion if you're prepared to throw some new mm -hmm. tomorrow. Uh, the next problem is, is the problem of, I mean, uh, uh, velocity. It's not just that it's 5.5 billion, it's that's where it is today. Uh, likely to be, you know, 8 billion next year, I mean, 10 or 12 billion the year after. Uh, this is then showing the interesting release, uh, I mean, size or rates of increase of these libraries over time. Uh, that uh, putting my favorite, I mean, class of XKCD cartoon up on, on the thing, uh, at the first part of an exponential curve, 
everyone says, oh, it's nothing to worry about. You know, I'm used to all three cases of COVID. You know, what, what could possibly go, go, go wrong? Uh, but essentially, as the numbers get bigger and bigger, eventually you hit the pain point and then realize you, you've had an exponential growth curve all along. Uh, uh, my one piece of subliminal advertising. Uh, but then essentially the, 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 the influence of fingerprint length. One of the things I had at the very bottom of the last slide uh, was the use of 256-bit fingerprints. And so some of the chemisticians in the room will start thinking, oh, uh, that's a bit short or a, a bit, bit small. Uh, one of the ways of slowing down or making searching of large chemical databases difficult uh, is, is essentially to do more work than you need to do. Uh, essentially, if you have 256-bit fingerprints, 1 billion molecules would require 34 gigabytes of memory, 512 bits would require 68, I mean, 1,024. Each time you're making the problem twice, four times, eight times harder. Uh, and for all that extra work, are you getting any better results? You're using more and more disk space, more and more resources, more and more processors. Uh, and well, the graph here, being produced by my colleague John, uh, shows that actually, I mean, uh, for all intents and purposes for bioactivity screening, uh, 256 or 512 bits is sufficient to distinguish your actives or inactives. To get your nearest 10,000, your nearest 20,000 compounds, uh, very short fingerprint lengths, I mean, uh, I mean uh, are, are useful. Uh, but then, of course, I mean, longer fingerprints, I mean, uh, as my colleague, you know, Noel had published, uh, are useful for, for fine ordering and fine scoring. So one of the things you can do with these very large databases of 5.5 billion is get your nearest 10,000 or nearest million out of your billions and then essentially rescore or reorder those uh, very much smaller, much manageable database uh, on the client afterwards. Then, of course, the third challenge is the data itself. I mean, how things get stored and how things get represented. Uh, an interesting technical challenge is, is that Enemy Real uh, started using MDLs enhanced stereochemistry from version 3000 long files. And so an interesting part of the sets of molecules with uh, and and or and enchmas, undefined stereocenters, uh, combinations of and and or stereochemistry and undefined stereocenters. And so essentially, you know, modern tools have to then keep track, I mean, of uh, uh, some of this ambiguity. It's interesting speaking here at the Cambridge Crystal Rapid Day Center is in the world of 3D crystallography, enhanced stereochemistry doesn't help at all. You either know what your molecule is with 3D coordinates or you don't. <laughs> uh, this is just suppliers saying, it'll, it'll sell you a mixture of things that the CCDC know, knows about uh, rather than any specific, specific one. Uh, likewise, another thing that makes the data difficult is the problem or representative problems of uh, normalization and representation of structures. Uh, the classic one, of course, is the challenge of tautomerism, how uh, tautomers of different molecules I mean, turn, up, I mean, turn up inside search systems. Uh, normally, this is handled by I mean, inchy and different types of normalization. Here, showing, for example, I mean, even in the world of substructure search, that it's often you know, substructures of, of molecules can be represented in different ways. And then, of course, you know, less of a problem for enamine, but, but increasingly as, as people move forward over time, uh, just the types of chemistry that people store and represent in computers, trying to handle the, uh, the octahedral, the square planar, the, the, the trigonal bipyramidal and the interesting representational challenges and database search challenges that go along with those types of molecules. So now we're on to the, the, the hardware part of, I mean, part of the, the, the talk. What are the other things that make things different? And it's the, the, the counterintuitively, uh, computers are normally I mean, compared or evaluated by how fast the clock speed they go, you know, a, a 3.8 gigahertz processor, a 4.2 gigahertz processor. It turns out for these sizes of databases, the types of problems we have nowadays, uh, the clock speed of the computer is almost irrelevant. The, the, uh, it can do work instantaneously, uh, I mean, based on the number of cores, the number of threads it can run. It, it's keeping the, the, the computer busy. It, it's the, the, the bandwidth or the throughput into the machine uh, becomes the rate limiting step. And so if you're interested in your problem is, is, is less than a few megabytes or a few, few hundred K, uh, clock speed is important. But it turns out for these data sets or things we're looking at, uh, it turns out initially then bus speed becomes important. I mean, how fast can the memory be written to the processor and retrieved back again? Uh, which is the number of processor channels that a particular CPU or Intel or AMD core has multiplied by the memory speed. Uh, it's interesting, this is one of the numbers that, for example, is published by Amazon Web Services. They won't tell you, well, what speed does the memory work? I mean, here. Uh, but clearly, if you go online or start buying something from Lenovo or Dell, you can find out what type of memory speed and what type of throughput you get. And you can see here that essentially, I mean, modern RAM speeds will give you about 200 gigabytes a second uh, into the core from, from memory. Uh, Worse is if your data does not fit in RAM, then IO performance becomes the rate limiting step, not how fast the RAM, I mean, RAM is anymore, uh, but it's getting things off the disk. Uh, and so we live in a world of either, I mean, non-volatile memories, NVMe, uh, SSD drives, uh, hard drives, I mean, I mean, again, at a small fraction of the speed, uh, and then worst of all, you know, network. 
as soon as you have a network involved in any of this, moving information from one place to another, such as an NFS mounted disk drive, uh, that then becomes the rate limiting or, bo or, or bottleneck. Uh, it is interesting, for example, in the world of Am clouds and Amazon Web Services, everything's on the cloud and connected to a network. Uh, they may store the disk drives on the West Coast of the United States, the computers on the East Coast, uh, that they can't possibly manage the bandwidth and throughput uh, that just a laptop in front of you can, can achieve. And then the other thing that's a bit strange about the way that large I mean, uh, data problems uh, shake up, I mean, the, the status quo or what's believed to be the, the case in, uh, in, 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 in current computing is that GPUs don't help at all. I mean, uh, normally NVIDIA cards are fantastic for, you know, Call of Duty, Battlefield, Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, all the useful things that quantum chemists like doing, uh, even molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, but it turns out that uh, I mean, because they have so little memory on side on, on terms of the cards themselves, uh, it will speed up problems that are trivial in size. Yes, a GPU will go faster than a CPU, uh, but you can only fit, for example, a few hundred uh, molecules onto a GPU card to do a, an analysis for. And if your data set is that small, it is trivial. Uh, for the, the big enamine style, Wuxi, Galaxy, I mean, uh, uh, M MQL Ultimate databases we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the GPUs just don't, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean aren't, aren't useful there. Then the third or the other interesting aspect of, of, of hardware and hardware economics uh, is the interesting, I mean, it should be I mean, obvious in hindsight, uh, the economics of, I mean, how to put RAM into a system or how to, I mean, to build a, a, a network. I mean, it turns out that buying a machine uh, with two bit terabytes of memory is cheaper than two machines with one terabyte of memory uh, because, of course, the processor and the box and everything else is duplicated. And those two one terabyte machines are cheaper than four, five, 12 terabyte machines uh, and <laughs> turtles all the way down, as they say. Uh, but the take home message is that the largest machine you can afford is the most cost effective. Uh, that effectively, the, the, the bigger the hardware that you can buy, the better it is uh, in, in, in to, in to use it. Uh, so essentially, I mean, a small number of large machines is better than a large number of small machines. Uh, the bit that's a bit controversial about this, again, clouds without silver linings, is unfortunately the current trend to move everything in Amazon Web Services to be completely, you know, in cloud virtual. Uh, of using large numbers of small machines over a slow network with very high latency storage uh, is exactly the, the, the worst way to handle, you know, enamine style database or large chemical searching. It's almost the anti-pattern of how to do this. Uh, you know, uh, Andreas Bender worked with several companies, uh, Farm Enabled, Helix, uh, that would like to believe they can do everything they need to do on the, on, on the cloud. Uh, the problem is, is that, that it's great for large people are using, you know, uh, uh, a bit of compute or a large amount of, you know, I mean, Christmas shopping, uh, it works terribly for this type of, I mean, in chemistry and data analysis. And the reason is, is elastic compute is fantastic for, uh, for computational chemistry or computer intensive tasks, uh, where essentially most of your machines are idle for most of the time. And so if, if one person's not using it, another person can. Uh, you can, you can, you know, share the resources and, and economies of scale. Uh, but disk drives or, or large data just doesn't work like that. Uh, when your disk drive isn't spinning, you can't use it for something you're storing something else. That effectively, uh, your data or your large amount of data has to be provisioned in advance and, and put together. Uh, however, I may mean, point out it is possible to federate them. I mean, there are uh, some interesting ways of stitching all this together and federating search over multiple servers. One of the ways of making the problem more tractable is to have you know, different bits of your database or different parts of enemy on, on, on different servers under a network. And then, I mean, plug them all together uh, under a technology, I mean, uh, 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 that effectively federate the database search, shards or partitions and put things together. And so, for example, I mean, at NextMove, it's one of the, 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 the tricks that we use underneath the surface for handling, you know, very large databases. It turns out that each of our database instances for efficiency uh, will only work up to two to the 64, I mean, or two to the 64, four billion compounds, I mean, mean, mean locally, uh, but then essentially by providing a, a server that sits in front of all of those uh, multiples of, of a four billion database, I mean, compound database can put together. But the other thing I'll point out here again is, is, is why the cloud's slowly working against you. Uh, the line connecting, you know, the user or the outside world with each of these databases uh, and under Amazon Web Services uh, is assumed to be a public network that uses a lot of cryptography. I mean, I mean storage is, is, is backed up to multiple redundant and all levels of, you know, uh, 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 bloat in the grand design of things that are getting in the way of getting the job done. Uh, but it turns out that technologically we're in, technologically, we're in a golden age uh, the rate of improvement to computer hardware and the types of boxes we have available to us are getting better. I mean, I mean, I mean, awe-inspiring, you know, uh, a rate. 
Uh, storage density follows an example of the Moore's logic curve. This is showing uh, back there is showing the cost per I mean, mean per, per gigabyte uh, of um, I mean different drives over time, starting 2009 down to 2017, showing that data is getting cheaper and cheaper. So uh, this, of course, is a, a, a screenshot from my, my Amazon shopping cart earlier in the week, uh, showing that, for example, on Black I mean, I mean, uh, Cyber Monday, uh, well, Black Friday, I, 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 I bought it. Uh, I bought myself five 20 terabyte disk drives online uh, for 287 pounds, 288 pounds each. Uh, that effectively says, well, that's you know, seventeen dollars per, I mean, per, per, per per terabyte. Uh, it turns out the box that turned up on Monday was pretty much the same as the entire re research computer. I mean, of uh, uh, of many UK pharmaceutical companies uh, and, and equivalents there, there there all. I mean, anyone that isn't buying discs when they're half the price, I mean, on, on a Friday sale, really is making their problem far harder than it needs to be. Uh, so this is what we actually do ourselves. Uh, uh, we have little, I mean, uh, workstation-like boxes we just stick underneath in, in, in the desk. You can see here for three and a half thousand dollars, you can buy an interesting, you know, work form box, and then put, you know, a number of different drives in. Uh, these aren't supercomputers; these are just, you know, off-the-shelf type of I mean, components. But I mean, uh, four times thirty U.2 drives is 120 terabytes of, of fast storage, uh, and a machine that would rival some of the, the, the bigger computer companies in the world. Then we move on to software. Now I shall start, you know, uh, 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 I mean, stirring up the religious wars and what have you. The wonders of C++ versus Python. Uh, software development and software engineering is a trade-off between the effort re required to write a piece of software versus its runtime. I mean, I mean, performance. I apologize, shouldn't be able to show you now. Uh, so there's a question of, you know, how something is easy to write or a pedagogical and teaching advantage. And it turns out that most research software is only run a few times by the author. So it's a fantastic environment for people to learn Python or scripting languages uh, in, in, uh, in JavaScript. Uh, but commercial software, when you're working on this sort of scale, uh, you really need to use ahead of time compilation, allowing aggressive optimization. Uh, you make the problem harder for the people developing the software so you get better results I mean, in downstream. And then likewise, I mean, for some of our stuff, uh, pre-computation, uh, often we're involving CPU centuries, even CPU millennia of work of calculations and storing the results pre-computed on disk is, is a way of essentially I mean, providing the state of the art in, in, in software you know, going forward, but requires a huge amount of upfront, I mean, upfront cost uh, to be sunk. Uh, so an example of showing some of the, the impact and uh, you know, effects of this uh, is essentially to look at the different types of software that are out there and how things work. Uh, here, for example, smart monetization speed. If I'm trying to work out the duplicates, how many duplicates are there in an enemy cell database or an intersection overlap test with the machine? Uh, you realize that RDKIT and Inchi uh, can do a few thousands of molecules a second, uh, but for these size of databases, you really need to be working on the, the, the hundreds of thousands of molecules a second. Uh, more recently, for example, just the, the interesting task of fingerprint generation. Uh, RDKIT, as you use it today, uh, will do about 126 molecules I mean, I mean, a second. It would take 91 days to do 1 billion molecules on, on, on a single core. Uh, I, mean, in, uh, I mean, software, when it's written and designed for speed, uh, should be able to get about 219,000 molecules a second, and you should be able to do about a billion molecules on a single core in about 76 minutes. Uh, the reason I put, I mean, RD Kit 2023 in there is that my colleagues and I have contributed. We're trying to make the RD Kit or the, you know, the free software I mean, better. I mean, I mean uh, and push the state of the art. Uh, but the difference or the shortfall between what needs to be done for these huge, massively sized problems. Uh, here's one for the, 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 the geeks in the audience. I mean, I, I often don't get away without writing a teeny bit of software. Is that, you know, real programs don't even use C and C++. It's all done in assembly language underneath the surface. It turns out those nice people that have the latest M1 Macintoshes uh, have some interesting, I mean, high performance undocumented features. Uh, they can do pop counts 128 bits at a time. Uh, but because C and C++ don't have a type that's 128 bits, most people don't know about it or the code doesn't get to use it. And so unless you're using assembly language built in extrinsics, uh, getting the maximum performance out of the modern hardware uh, is, is actually you know, mean, uh, mean, mean challenging. Uh, then we get down to the, end, the interesting, the final part, getting down to the science at the very end, uh, the problem of the similarity measure, where, where that then creates interesting challenges. And the first thing I'll say is I'm a huge, huge fan of, of, of the Tanimoto coefficient. It worked very well for chemical over many, many years. Uh, often used as a binary co I mean, a similarity coefficient between two molecules. Uh, the bits, two bit, bit strings have in common uh, divided by the number of bits I mean, they ha have combined. 
Uh, what's interesting is when you start thinking about this or putting it together, is that for any given query, this penalizes missing bits more than adding additional bits. Effectively, there's an interesting asymmetry based on the division uh, that basically says if given a query fingerprint, if I turn a bit off, uh, that has a huge cost. But if I add a bit on, it has less of an effect. And of course, it all comes back down to the work of uh, uh, Peter Willett from the University of Sheffield in the 1780s that selected Kamoto. Uh, is empirically, this has been selected for and, and trained on uh, finding out the probability that your neighbors are active and your query is active. But pretty much you've, set, you've put into the mix there is something about this active molecule I like, a pharmacophore or an interaction that's important. And therefore I'm trying to find something else that's similar than it. And so clearly removing things, I mean, I mean from I mean, your active molecule, uh, maybe throwing away the secret sauce, what it is that the interaction that's making things important. Uh, and so because it's interesting then to see it tells you nothing about how similar to inactive compounds are or useful for usefulness for diversity selection. Uh, however, I mean, at the very bottom, uh, Tanimoto for all its fantastic features, have problems with, with, with contextual dependence and dimensionality reduction. It is, uh, although it works very well, the mathematics has a number of interesting interesting challenges. And so here, for example, is a, uh, an, an issue of the problem with, Taramo I mean, I mean, with, with Tanimoto. These are two molecules uh, that I'd like to claim, I mean, are, are, are very distant. They have, I mean, a large difference in molecular weights. One has 40 carbons, I mean, the other has 20, 24. Essentially, you mean, mean uh, Although they have I mean, I mean, a, a, a lot in common or a shared, I mean, a shared interest, they both have the same biological activity. It turns out that when you put them into I mean, a, a biological system, uh, the benzhydryl I mean, ester I mean, cleaves off almost straight away. Uh, and effectively, the two molecules in their active state or as a prodrug uh, have almost identical I mean, behavior. But what's interesting is the bit that's then lost or, or different between the, 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 the esters versus the free acid are of course the, the, these interesting phenyl rings, which are already part of the parent molecule. Those bits have already been taken into account. Uh, these fingerprints on both sides look almost identical, even though there is a large change in molecular weight, a large change in log p. Uh, what we really want is to find an example where uh, changing the R1s and R2s uh, in different parts of a molecule uh, is independent of the cost of the rest of it. And so the, the, the approach that we take at next move or the way that we believe it goes forward is the use of of graph edit distance, uh, the minimum number of edit operations transform one graph into another, similar as, as protein sequences, uh, and essentially you mean use that as a, a measure or a metric. One of the nice things about that is it allows us to divide up chemical space and switch up by the number of bonds and number of rings in a molecule. So here is a, a production of, of chemical space uh, showing bond count from zero to 99 on the bottom and ring count from a cyclic molecules in the bottom, one ring in the up, two rings up to, I think it's 47, 48 rings. And one of the nice things about this representation or this way of projecting chemical space, uh, you can see that benzene and pyridine would fall into B6R1, uh, six bonds and one ring. Uh, in, in aspirin, uh, abilify, you know, buckminster fullerene having 90 bonds and 31. Uh, it has a nice property that as a hashing method, uh, one can find the nearest neighbors of a molecule by looking in its box and its surrounding and neighboring boxes is that one can find things that are related to you without looking at the vast majority of chemical space or, or, or the entirety of the database. It breaks that linearity problem we were talking about previously. Uh, skip over this bit, I'm getting near the end. Uh, but then interesting as a thought experiment, or just to finish off with a teeny bit of, 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 of science, is that uh, many people will talk about searching 10 to the 24, 10 to the 18, 10 to the 60. Uh, I'm about to show you how to search an infinite size database and leave you the question of whether it's a useful thing to do. And so it turns out that peptides are an interesting form of synthetic in therapeutic molecules. Uh, there are a near infinite number of them, and all of them are, I mean, are synthetically possible. I can give you a peptide synthesizer. And so you're saying is that, well, given the 20 con amino acids and a query of length n, there are 20 to the n bits or sequences that would have that length that I could store and pre-enumerate and put in a database. And in bioinformatics, one would typically use uh, protein similarity, which is BLAST or FAST-A, uh, Smith Waterman or Eden Winch Sellers, uh, and a scoring matrix to then search through that, uh, you know, 20 to the n style database. It turns out you can apply an interesting piece of mathematics. Here's the, the Blossom 62 matrix used for comparing protein sequences uh, that showed, for example, I mean, cysteines and tryptophan are extremely well preserved. Uh, but I mean, essentially, the Blossom matrix which expresses substitution frequencies as log odds such that maximizing some of the scores is equivalent to maximizing product probability. So trying to find uh, which are the most probable neighbors inside a database. Uh, 
And so one can come up and then produce, I apologize, hopefully this comes out uh, in, in Oxford and, and, and Berlin or is projected moderately well. Uh, but effectively the 46 amino acid sequence crambin is used to query at the top. Uh, the number of hits there is shown as a very large number with 46 zeros at the very end. Uh, is this the second to last slide? I, um, <laughs> I appreciate people are getting a bit worried. Uh, but here showing, for example, what the top 10 hits are uh, as one searches the infinite database. But then at the very bottom, you can see the hundredth, the thousandth, the ten thousandth, the hundred thousandth, the millionth, the billionth. Uh, we go past two to the 32. Actually, I use, I mean, 128 bit integers to keep track of these things. Uh, and so you can see that, uh, I mean, the hundred trillionth bit has its sequence identity at the very bottom. I can even work back the other way and say it's like, a, although it's an uncountably large number of hits, uh, the number, I mean, the, the, the hit that's furthest away from Cranbin is zero point three three NT at the bottom. Uh, and then the other hit that has the same score at maximum distance. Uh, but of course, the question is now that I can search an infinite size H space, I, I, I win the prize versus Biosolve IT and others for uh, you know, uselessly sized database. The question is, but is this useful? At which time I either then reached the end in some way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ultra large databases and other big data applications create interesting challenges in, in chemismatics uh, and investments in, in hardware and software can, can help tackle the problems. Uh, ultimately, the, the size of the problems we try and tackle are defined by the, techno defined by the technology we have available. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, thank the rest of my team and the huge number of people that made this possible. And again, Chris Wayne and Andreas, then Jeff Smith, thank you. Thanks very much, Roger, for a really, really fascinating talk. Uh, we're running a bit tight on time, but maybe we have time for one question, a quick one. Uh, does anyone in the audience have any questions? Chris? We, we talked about the... Uh, Hang on, if we just... Uh, the problem of um, chopping off phenol rings from things not affecting the fingerprint. That's just because we don't keep account of the number of on and off bits. Oh, on bits. Exactly. It's, it's a, a strange artifact of the, the, the similarity methods we, we choose to use. You see that the uh, protein distance has this nice property that the cost of changing one bit at one part of the sequence is independent of changing the cost in another part. Uh, and it's true, counted fingerprints have better properties. Uh, but then likewise, is, is you, can, you can imagine coming up with an A where, where the Similarity of our, I mean, building block one and similarity of building block two allow you an easy way to compute the similarity of the product. Uh, and those are the types of similarity methods that would be nice to use in the future. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much. If anybody else has any questions for Roger, then uh, please ask them on the chat and uh, I'll give him my phone and maybe he can uh, answer them. <laughs> All right, uh, then we'll move on to our next speaker uh, over in Oxford. Garrett, do you wanna take it away for us? Hello, can you hear us? I can hear an echo in here, so you must be able to. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, hello from Oxford. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce one of the postdocs from Oxford Protein Informatics Group, uh, Matteo Furla, who's gonna tell us about Fragmentstein and reanimating re molecules from fragment, fragment corpses. Did I mangle your title? Hopefully, hopefully that's, that gets the point across. So, uh, yeah, if, if you can't hear us, just shout in the chat. Uh, and you've got 22 minutes starting now. Yeah, and my computer just froze. Um, oh, and it's moving ahead. Sorry, am I trying to unlock the screen? Yeah, sorry. Um, the title was accurate, but uh, the topic is indeed not mangled uh, titles, but actually mangled molecules. So, um, and um, it ties actually in very nicely with uh, previous with the previous presenter because I'll actually be talking about some results using small worlds, coincidentally. Um, so yes, uh, I'm Matteo from the University of Oxford, and I will start by a rather pointless recap of what uh, fragment-based drug discovery is, which I hope you all know. I am sharing, I believe. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Is everything visible now? Is everything visible now? Uh, 
Okay. Um, no, it's good. Yeah. This is what it looks like. Uh, there's a bit of delay, yeah. so can you go full screen? Uh, yeah. And this is why, oh, perfect, I believe. He's sharing the screen now. Yeah. Uh, you want to go to presenter mode, I think? Swap displays. Oh, no, no. You just want mirror. <laughs> you don't want. You don't want it this way around. Well, this this looks good, but everyone here is. I bet it's, it's okay. I, I I know what my next slides are, so I apologize to everyone here in Oxford that has to see what the next slides are. Spoiler alerts. Um. Anyway. Um. Sorry about that. So where was I? Oh yeah. Fragment-based drug discovery relies on the principle that um, the ability that one can detect if one can detect weak binding weak binding um it leverages on the point that um analogs bind similarly so if you search for weak binders you can find similar uh, analogs that are better and you can work from there so um where you working from um uh, where, where one working from uh um sorry um substructure based approaches for example um one can do merging of two two hits linking them or one can expand on a link and uh, and one can find therefore uh, a better follow up compound and my keys are not working perfect um <laughs> technical issues all the way around here sorry um during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, the COVID Moonshot Consortium um, came together, and the aim of this was to do a drug screen campaign for the SARS-CoV-2 protease, and uh, you, leveraging on uh, the uh, the pan data analysis methodology and the high throughput systems developed at Diamond in uh, XChem. Um, and uh, leveraging on the public, where the public was called for follow-up compound suggestions, and diverse strategies were used, there was different groups involved, and it was quite multidisciplinary. Um, one small problem was that uh, with all these submissions, these submissions were as uh, smile strings. And, um, and one had to figure out what was going on. Why were these submissions given? So docking was done, and there was this common trend that docking wasn't faithful to the inspirations that um, gave them. For example, over here, we've got a, a synthetic, a fake example of a catechol and a cumaric acid. And these two, uh, if you merge them by substructure, the two rings get merged, which is not correct. Instead, we want the, them placed differently by structure. And where you to dock, you might get a ligand that the, your hit gets bound in a different spot. Um, and that is far from idea, ideal. So to solve this, um, we came, I came up with Fragmentstein, which is a method that instead of, uh, instead of working primarily on substructure-based methods, actually is primarily focused on the atom positions it obeys the atom positions. So as a result, in the merging, you will get the two rings next to each other and uh, for both for merging. Whereas for placement, I'm not calling it docking because I'm not going from a, from a set of conformers. I'm making a distorted conformer in place and relaxing it. So there's no, so it's backwards. And so for the placements, the, the hit might get played. If one were to dock, the hit might go somewhere. The, your compound that you're docking will go somewhere. Whereas by obeying the fragments, you might find it in a different position, even if that were to favor a, um, an isomer. Um, you can play around with the uh, with some examples. Uh, there's a playground that's quite the uh, that's quite fun notebook and uh, 
And uh, Fragmentstein works on Python 3 for the uh, molecular operations. It works on RD kit. And for the protein minimization, it the protein ligand interaction minimization, the energetics is via uh, Play Rosetta for now. And then a common question I get asked, and uh, I have to reveal that I did a bit of a blunder here. The Fragmentstein algorithm actually uses both elements from both the books and the novels at the same time. I, am, I apologize for that, but hopefully it's still funny and someone might cite me. <laughs> okay, um, now going into the details of the combination, I'm saying combination and not merging because it also does linking as in adding atoms between two non-overlapping structures. And the first thing we re one realizes when looking at, um, at doing mergers is that actually when you've got two hits that are overlapping, um, they might not overlap perfectly. Over here, for example, on the left-hand side, you can see um, that there's a, there's a methyl group that's sticking out that's actually closer to the rings. And then two rings on the other side are actually not quite overlapping. And when you look at the and th this uh, this is a user submitted follow up from the MPRO, uh, the COVID moonshot. And as you can see, it it's still the follow up still obeys them, although it obeys some subparts more than others. So how does one deal with those? In Fragmentstein, uh, there's a rules based approach of what atoms match to which atoms. So the simple rules. Two, only one atom can map to another atom, not more. And the two atoms must be within two angstroms of each other, otherwise they don't bind. And uh, as we'll see in the next slide, there's rings, um, are, the rings can be a bit of a problem. And as a result, um, they get converted into uh, an R group, a dummy atom, a star. Um, uh, the, Sorry, the, the ring. Sorry, rings get converted into a placeholder atom, whereas attachment points are dummy atoms, and uh, those cannot map with uh, regular atoms. Uh, whereas a ring can map to a ring, and an attachment point can map to an attachment point. Um, here's a detail of the ring collapsing. Um, uh, strategy that's implemented in Fragmentstein, namely, if you want to map. If you want to, if you've got an overlapping five-membered ring and a six-membered ring, if you were to just map the atoms as they were, you'd get a monster, even more monstrous than some of the results. So as a result, uh, what happens is that the rings get replaced by a dummy atom, sorry, not dummy atom, by a placeholder atom. Um, you can see in the middle that then they overlap with each other. And then when the rings are expanded, that you've got a nice normal looking ring and not some distorted monstrosity. And um, this is one of the main reasons why, unlike breed, it works by atom positions and not um, bonds. Um, here's an example, uh, an actual synthetic experiment where a furin ring and a benzene ring uh, move from overlapping and away. Um, and they give different structures depending on how, how close they are. So you, till the, you get fused spiro, and after a certain point, uh, the joining, they get linked together. And um, obviously, sometimes you do get some nastinesses, and there is a rectification process where certain criteria are met, certain criteria are filtered out against stuff like, uh, in this case, on the bottom, you could would see that you get a oxygen with free carbon atoms, which would be a no-no um, at regular protonation. Um, so as a result, atoms get switched over and uh, and stuff gets reduced um, if the if they would have too many bonds happening. Um, and this is. Uh, and, and this is this could actually be quite useful in general, and it's a, a self-standing part and not actually within fragalysis, so can be useful whatever. It allows stuff to be sanitized, as Ardikit calls them. 
Um, however, even after sanitization, you might get some distortion in the monster, in the monster molecule you've made. So as a result, we need to not inject energy into it, but take away energy, make lower that, lower that potential energy. So as a result, minimization happens, and that's done in pyrosata, which uh, which we'll see a few slides along, allows covalent attachment points and, um, and is, uh, and yeah, and the minimization, uh, I should say, is first done with strict, very heavy constraints and the constraints are relaxed and relaxed more until the, until the potential becomes negative. And uh, at that point, the distortion would have been so much that your RMSD will be quite big and that molecule will probably be binned because it's not working. Um, Fragmentstein's found usage in uh, Gebauer and Al uh, released this year, published this year, sorry, um, in which uh, a fragment screen, uh, various hits from a fragment screen were merged. Uh, and the best hit was this one here in pane A, uh, where two close molecules are linked and, uh, and, various, uh, and, um, and various analogs. Unfortunately, the main one, um, the main merger was not synthetic, was not that synthetic accessible, was unavailable in making the man space in the enamine real. However, um, small world, as we saw on the previous talk, uh, and Arthur also were used to um, to find hits that were purchasable. And uh, following the placement, there was this cool thing that there's uh, uh, some uh, some extra bits uh, were present in some of the molecules, which fortuitously uh, bound quite nicely. And when those were synthesized, purchased, I mean. Um, they had the, they resulted in submicromolar affinity. So from the second step, so that was really nice. Now to the second thing, the placement challenge, the not docking, docking backwards as if it were. Um, this has also got the same atom overlap idea, but works, but has an extra level that you've got an intended molecule that you want to place and you have to map the atoms in the wanted molecule in the target molecules. It's not obviously a question of a single substructure or similar because there's two molecules that you need to place. So um, there's three ways that generally get, the, get used here. Um, if you're just fall, placing an analog that you searched from an analog search that's based on the merger, you could just simply use a merger. But um, in the case that you've got two hits and want to place a molecule, there's uh, an iteration that goes on of various substructure searches with, with more lax and lax constraints till the whole, at the whole molecule gets covered or nearly there with misleading atoms chucked away because there can be misleading atoms as we saw before. Um, another option is to decompose the molecules and merge the bits that actually are relevant, but that's a last resort. Um, here's a, a nice test done on historical data, um, a C, um, an SGC merger. And as you can see, there's a nasty, it's not nasty, there's, a, there's an overlap that's not quite perfect. And uh, Fragmentstein predicted the merger, that's not the merger, sorry, predicted the placement of these two with um, quite accurately to, um, to what the follow-up compound actually looked like. And that is uh, a combination of not, not only obeying the inspirations, but taking a bit of liberties to energy minimize them, um, allowing it to um, give a nice result. But the fun thing about this data set was that there was a chiral center. So two chiralities. One was covalently bound. Um, I should have said, sorry, uh, you, this atom, it, uh, this compound's covalently bound. One chirality uh, bound, the other one didn't bound. And when, uh, when I made Fragmentstein model both as covalently bound, the one that didn't react, the unreacted one had a strained cysteine sulfur, 
and had the worst potential and was not a happy molecule. So Fragmentstein preferred the conformation that was found reacted to the conformation that empirically wasn't found reacted. So that's that was uh, a nice test. However, place, placing atoms um, has the requirement that, that sometimes a user may want to specify. This is another example using historical data, testing on historical data, where you've got a ring that's flipped. Um, the density actually supports both positions, but the release PDB structure has it in one single way. So, um, so allowing the user to map the map a few atoms, a subset of atoms, and controlling it allows a better modeling um, because the user know may know something that the algorithm doesn't. Now, um, how does it perform with the moonshot data that I mentioned before? Well, um, with over 50% of the moonshot targets that were crystallized and inspired by a compound, um, they were within two angstrom. And uh, I believe 40% were within one angstrom, uh, according to Fragmentstein. And when, that was comp when we compare that to docking, docking does not fare as well. This is with our dock on the left, on the left panel is uh, is free, unconstrained, and there's not a single one that um, is within one angstrom, or there's a couple that are within two angstroms. There's two, I can see three. Um, but when one adds pharmacophore constraints, it's still, it moves stuff towards where we want them to be, but still does not get nowhere close to the same accuracy as Fragmentstein does. Obviously, Fragmentstein's not perfect and hasn't mapped correctly some of them. There's a lot of dots still uh, that are towards the top of the y-axis, but that's because those compounds did not dock in the way that what they were intended to. They dock somewhere else in the molecule, throwing everything off. Um, uh, they were a bad inspiration. They were, a, they were badly inspired. <laughs> Um, Fragmentstein's also got some, has found some other uses. Um, Harold, uh, Harold Grosjean from, um, from the Phil Biggins group actually modeled, um, had to model, uh, had ligands that bound in two different poses that were quite similar to each other and did, uh, but changed the, con the conformation of the protein. So he modeled them. Um, using Fragmentstein and the two positions as a starting position for MD and to see how the system reverted to a, a different one. And uh, so that, um, so yeah. Um, another example of Fragmentstein's usage uh, it, that's actually not in, fra in fragment-based drug discovery is uh, in biochemistry, it's common to use an analog that's not hydrolyzable of your cofactors, but this is not biologically too relevant and someone would want a substrate bound form and so you can convert a GDP to a GTP or reduced um, NADH to a, uh, anyway, you switch around the molecule. So, and that's actually kind of cool. Theoretically, one could even do model using Fragmentstein, the full catalytic uh, reaction that goes on in the substrates. And one could probably even predict better how your ligand predict better drug design by by modeling what's specific what's not um yeah so to recap uh, fragmentstein is faithful to its inspirations and can work with more than one inspiration hit which is quite uncommon um and uh, can deal with covalent molecules as we saw is open source although pyrosetta does need a license um and um, it's got a lot of features that were driven by user interaction with empirical data. It's not a castle in the sky. Um, but however, it does have the con of being slightly slower than docking, takes about less than 30 seconds for a good pose, more for a horrible one. And, um, and the combination method does have the issue that you do need to find something purchasable in make and demand space, um, which is, it can be limiting at times. And uh, 
and does perform poorly if there's too many red herrings in the inspirations. So um, thank you all for listening and thank you for organizing this great talk, this great uh, thing, the <laughs> session. And thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Mr. Um, thank, you thank you very, very much. much. Uh, do we have any questions from this audience or online? There is one online, so I'll go into that while you think of questions. Um, so Clara uh, asked, great talk. I was wondering whether very varied parts of your code would actually be super useful for the Open Free Energy Consortium to improve their atom typing algorithm. Um, so the... Actually, for this, I had to write my own uh, my own RD kit to PyRosetta Atom um, parameterization tool. I did, and uh, but I am planning on. Oops, that's your time. Oh, sorry. I am planning actually to convert uh, um, uh, Fragmentstein to use OpenFF and OpenMM in order to do the full calculation. So actually, I'll be moving it towards. Uh, the open uh, the open consortiums fragment force fields anyway so yeah, yeah cool. um, okay uh any questions from from oxford or online cambridge or from then we've got another so one 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 question i had is um Presumably, because you're using pyrosetta, you have sort of induced fit in the protein as well. Yeah, well, that, you've got the same problem that you've got with docking. The starting template is the template. Is the, everything depends on what yeah. template. If you've chosen a closed confirmation, an open confirmation, an active, an active thing, mm. that is half your game choosing a correct template. So yeah, the, you've got the same problem that plagues. Um, play except that docking too it's uh but it will relax sort of bad contacts yeah it will relax the side yeah. chains repack them and um, yeah cool okay so uh unless there are any other questions i think we can um, we i think someone's waving oh someone's waving sorry we've got broken so, so there's on the one more seminar. question from, from berlin i think it's from clara right or no no that's the one that's the Okay, so yeah, so we have, yeah, so we have one question from Berlin. Who is it? No, I think it was La uh, Clara's question, and it's over. Okay. Do we have time for more questions or not? Um, can, can you, yeah, was that the only question? So whose question was that? Your so Clara's question. That, that was already okay, answered. No so Clara's question was already answered. So we have no more questions, right? Okay, there is one more question. <laughs> we have one more question from Yoav Shamia. Can you hear me? No. No. Can you hear us? Okay. <laughs> Great talk. Can Fragmentstein be used to merge two hits from, from a virtual screen while specifying that one of them can be covalently bound? No, we don't hear them. So I think we can't hear you. You're muted at the moment. Sorry. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so so you could start with the you could start with two hits that were screened virtually. There's no way to change the weights of what atoms you would like to be more. Say you did trust one hit more than the other. Say, um, but yes, and it could deal with covalence if one of them was covalent, or you wanted to convert a uh, to those two molecules into a covalent. You could.